1976, on the 5th of August, at 3.45 a.m., a major failure occurred in Big Ben, the clock. And unfortunately, there was, uh, uh, there was a disaster that occurred and that on the 8 o'clock and 7 o'clock news on the BBC, you could hear that Big Ben was no longer sounding. And the failure uh, had resulted in the weight, which weighed a, a tonne and a quarter, descending down the 180-foot shaft, and the wire rope that comes from the weight wrapped round a big barrel, which weighs uh, 500 weight and isn't much smaller than the size of this table. That was wrenched out of the frame of the clock and thrown across the room onto the bench where you normally sit when you've climbed the 180 steps up to the clock room. So we knew, because I had a knowledge of the components of, of the clock, what likely components might have failed. And sure enough, what had happened was the, f the safety brake, the fan, the big fly, on the top of the clock had become detached from the rest of the clock mechanism, allowing the weight to descend down the shaft at a very f fast rate, and it ripped this big barrel from the clock. The whole of the end of the clock got uh, broke. Um, bits of clock were through the roof and everywhere. And if anybody had been up there, they would have been killed. So a group of, of uh, scientists, Sunder Norman Owen, and included Phil Irvin, who was an expert in fatigue, uh, and myself and Jim Furs from the design office uh, got involved and we went up there and, and a report, an NPL report was produced that detailed the failure investigation and we did some metallography on the, on the uh, components um, and it turns out it was the longest time recorded fatigue failure that's ever been recorded because it, over the 120 to 130 years life of the clock a crack had propagated up the shaft that supported the fly, which acted as a governor, had propagated over a metre up that shaft. It had then gone through 90 degrees. The shaft had sheared off. The shaft itself that supported that was actually a butt-welded, seamed butt-welded tube, rather like a piece of gas pipe. And the crack was propagating up the, the join of the seam, and you couldn't see it if you were up there. It was The lighting up the tower was too small, to, too poor to be uh, capable of seeing it. It turned out, and that was August 1976, that the Queen was due to, as part of her Silver Jubilee celebrations, was due to come round and unveil a new fountain in St Stephen's Yard at the base of the tower, uh, of the Westminster Tower. So the pressure was on, what do we do? Do we just put a synchronous electric motor behind the dials? Uh, do, uh, you know, it wouldn't be possible to repair the clock in that time scale between the six months between August and spring 1977. I sat in on a committee with other people uh, at the time when we were discussing, do we bother to repair it? And I was saying, no, for goodness sake, this is the heritage of the nation. This is very important. This is the iconic clock, mechanical clock in the world. We must get it repaired. And I'm very pleased to say that Thwaites and Reed managed to produce uh, the designs uh, and re, re managed to manufacture the clock. These days it would take you six months sitting on a committee to decide whether or not the funding was available to get it repaired. But within six months that clock was completely rebuilt. One of the things that NPL contributed to was a safety break. So to prevent any further failures occurring to the clock, a special type of safety break was designed. And Jim Furs from the Engineering Design Office and myself were coming back from the Palace of Westminster, having been up to the clock to do some measurements on it to think how we could de develop a safety break. And we were on the train coming back from Waterloo, back to Teddington, and I kept saying, look, we want a safety break that is fully self-contained. It shouldn't rely on any external sources because if there's a power failure and it's electric and the power goes down, it won't work and so on. So Jim whips out an envelope, classic back of the envelope type of thing that really does happen. And he said, well, what about if we design a safety break whereby we have a mechanical clutch that is geared into the wheels, the great wheels on the clock movement, on the striking train and on the quarter chiming train, so that as, as the wheels turn under their normal operation, if they start to turn too fast, a little balls could run up a ramp and it form a mechanical clutch 
which would then enable the clutch to engage, and as it engages, it would turn a left-hand and right-handed screw thread, and caliper arms would come in and clamp the wheel. And within, if, so those were designed and built. They were actually manufactured by apprentices uh, who were working in the, in the workshop at NPL, and um, they were installed on the clock uh, under the supervision of Jim Furs and Ernie Wills. And that, those safety brakes are still there and working today. Um, a new history of the clock uh, and details all the failure investigation has been written up, and that includes, that's this Big Ben book here uh, by Chris Mackay. That gives details of the safety break, the NPL safety break. And I'm pleased to say I was invited up only two weeks ago to the book launch of the new um, guide to Big Ben. And again, the safety investigation that we undertook in 1976 is all included in this book. <laughs>